we'd like to welcome everybody to the December meeting in the Mississippi PowerShell User Group. Our speaker tonight is Trevor Sullivan. Uh, he's a Microsoft Solution Architect that specializes in process automation, large-scale Windows administration, and systems management infrastructure planning. Tonight he's going to be speaking about PowerShell remoting. And uh, with that, I'd like to just go ahead and turn it over to Trevor. Tonight I'd like to take some time to talk about PowerShell remoting in the enterprise and why it's important and what you should know about it. So a little bit of background about me is that I have nine plus years of experience in Microsoft IT doing you know, operating system deployment, systems management, uh, process automation with VBScript, PowerShell, uh, .NET, and all that type of stuff. System Center uh, configuration manager primarily. I've uh, been doing PowerShell since about 2007. I didn't get right into it when it was still called Monad in 06. Um, but, you know, when version 2 came out and maybe just a bit before that, I started really kind of taking it seriously and um, read a fabulous book, book by Bruce Payette, who's uh, one of the designers of PowerShell, one of the original ones. And uh, the book is called PowerShell in Action, if you're looking for it. And unfortunately, it hasn't been updated to, um, you know, reflect version 3 or 4 of PowerShell. But with PowerShell, you know, as long as you get a solid basis on version 1 or version 2, you know, everything else is just kind of build, uh, building block on top of that. So, you know, if you can get to know PowerShell version 2 pretty solidly, then, you know, understanding the new concepts in version 3 and 4 is just a matter of a little bit of incremental reading. So you didn't really come here to hear about me. You came here to be here, hear about PowerShell. And again, the topic is PowerShell remoting. So the first question that you kind of have to ask yourself is, well, why do I care about remoting? So what is remoting, uh, you know, why does it benefit me to use PowerShell remoting? Well, you know, you can use PowerShell on your local machine. That's great and all. You can run all sorts of automation scripts using, you know, various technologies, calling REST methods, calling, um, you know, WMI, you know, plugging into Windows services, plugging into Hyper-V, Configuration Manager, all these different, you know, third-party modules. But if you really want to manage your, your Windows operating systems, whether they're server or client operating systems, you really need the ability to deploy those scripts from a central location, from a, from a management computer or from a management server, out to your remote desktop and server client systems. So what that allows you to do is basically take a script, you know, you've tested it, you know it works locally on one or two machines, you've, you've vetted out all the bugs in it, hopefully. And, you know, then once you're prepared to deploy that, you can use PowerShell remoting to achieve that objective. Another reason to enable remoting in your environment is that the new PowerShell version 4 feature called Desired State Configuration, or DSC, relies on PowerShell remoting. So if you don't already have PowerShell remoting enabled, then you will be uh, limited in the functionality that you can take advantage of. Additionally, PowerShell Workflow was introduced in version 3, and that also requires the remoting to be enabled before you can take full advantage of it. If you're looking to interactively or remotely manage your server or client systems uh, from the command line, then you also want to take a look at remoting. Because if you're not using PowerShell remoting, chances are you're using something like PSExec or, you know, God forbid you're actually running SSH on top of Windows. I don't know why you do that, but I guess you could. But PowerShell uh, remoting allows you to do that that interactive, just kind of, you know, log in, run a couple commands, exit out of the session, um, you know, those quick types of scenarios. And uh, if you're like most admins, you probably get tied up with having, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 different RDP sessions in your taskbar. You can never figure out which one you're looking at. So in my opinion, it's a little bit more quicker to use and uh, just more efficient to use than remote desktop services. So now that we've kind of discussed the reasons why remoting is, is useful to us or can be useful to us in the future, uh, let's take a quick look at just how it works from an architectural perspective. Well, anytime you're dealing with remoting, you're going to have pretty much a client and a server. So the server is going to be sitting there listening for connections. Again, the server doesn't have to be a Windows server operating system. It could be a Windows client operating system, anywhere from Windows XP to Vista 7, 8, and 8.1. And on the server side, it could be 2003, 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, or 2012 R2. All of those operating systems support a minimum version of PowerShell 2.0. And as long as it supports PowerShell 2.0 uh, and the WinRM service, you'll be able to remotely manage that system with PowerShell remoting. So on the client side, 
you've got typically a PowerShell session running, right? And you want to deploy some script out to one or more servers. Again, clients as, are included as well. So the PowerShell remoting feature sits on top of the WinRM service or Windows Remote Management service. And WinRM sits on top of the HTTP library in the Windows operating system. Now, there's a significant advantage to WinRM sitting on top of the HTTP library, and that is the predictability of network traffic. So back in the day when we were using, uh, you know, batch scripts or VB script and other similar technologies, and we we're talking to, you know, WMI on remote systems, and we're doing any, any type of remote management of uh, computers, even something as simple as bringing up the computer management MMC snap-in, any of that, any, any of those operations are going to be performed through the DCOM RPC channel, which unfortunately is not very firewall friendly because it uses a dynamic, dynamic port range. So from a firewall kind of network security perspective, it's, it's again not very uh, predictable in how the network traffic is going to flow. But now that Microsoft's been going more standards-based with the WinRM service, we can now rely on ports 5985 and 5986, uh, both TCP, to be the two potential management uh, ports that we'll need to open up from a network perspective. So if you're a Windows administrator and you go talk to your network guys and say, hey, you know what, I really want to manage our systems through this new uh, WinRM system, this PowerShell remoting feature. And by the way, I can tell you two specific ports that you have to open up on every host. They're going to love you because, again, traditionally they had to deal with uh, dynamic port ranges. It was a lot um, kind of more open, so they'd have to open up a lot more ports to allow that management traffic to pass. But now they can kind of, uh, you know, restrict things down to a more uh, predictable traffic pattern. So on the client side, if you were to run a PowerShell remote command, it's going to run through WinRM, run through HTTP. It's going to go over to the remote server. The remote server is going to see that connection and pass it back up the chain up to a PowerShell session. So that's high level how it works. Well, how do you actually configure this functionality? Well, prior to Windows Server 2012, uh, PowerShell remoting was not enabled by default, so you'd actually have to enable it in order to take advantage of this functionality. I believe, starting with Windows Server 2012 or maybe 2012 R2, they actually have WinRM enabled by default in the operating system. So they're, they're obviously really trying to kind of push this as the new um, you know, management tool for the Windows platform. But if you want to get started in a lab and you're not really prepared to deploy this to all your systems, all you, can, all you really have to do is run the enable ps remoting force command on one of your servers. And that will basically configure the WinRM service to start listening on that port 5985 so that you can start making outbound connections to it. Now, if you have a PKI and you're interested in using SSL in your environment, uh, you can also run the set wsman quick config dash use SSL command. And as long as you have a server auth authentication certificate that's been published to all of your server or client Windows operating systems, that command will automatically find that server authentication certificate and it will bind it to the WinRM service. So looking back at our, back at our diagram here, uh, the thing that I kind of forgot to mention is that port 5985 is for standard HTTP connections, and TCP 5986 is for SSL connections. So it's very similar to kind of how you have the, you know, port 80 and port 443 in IAS uh, for HTTP and HTTPS connections, respectively. So aside from using the enable ps remoting dash force and set wsman quick config commands, you can also use group policy through Active Directory to standardize your configuration of WinRM across your environment. At the bottom here, I kind of have just a little workflow that you can follow through. If you're wanting to test this in a lab or just test it maybe on one or two systems in your production environment, um, these are just kind of the steps that you would manually run through in order to um, you know, get it up and running. So the first thing you're going to do is on your PKI, you're going to configure that server authentication certificate template. Uh, you're going to configure the GPO so that your clients can auto-enroll in that certificate template and actually get published a server authentication cert. Uh, 
Once you've got that cert published down to your clients, you'll run the enable PS remoting command to enable WinRM. And then after that, you'll run set WS man quick config, and that will take care of the certificate binding to the WinRM service. And then finally, uh, something we'll touch a little bit more on later is the enable WS man cred SSP command, which enables uh, certain scenarios uh, to work. And uh, when you're dealing with double hop authentication, uh, Cred SSP is going to be a, a pretty vital thing. And again, we'll get more into depth in that in a future slide. So the first thing that you're going to really have to configure on the server side in order to make sure that you can remotely connect to uh, PowerShell sessions on those servers is this setting for WinRM called Allow Remote Server Management Through WinRM. Now what this is going to do is it's going to instruct the WinRM service to start in the background, and it will also tell it to listen on particular IP addresses. Now, in the uh, pane here, in in the um, in the dialog where the option is opened, you'll see that there's an IPv4 filter and an IPv6 filter that you can uh, kind of more granularly configure. Well, if you leave these two fields blank, you're going to end up having a really hard time because the WinRM service is not going to be listening on any IP addresses. So you want to make very sure that you at least have an asterisk there. And what the asterisk does is it basically tells WinRM to listen on any IPv4 or any IPv6 interface that's installed on that particular system. So again, if you leave those fields blank, WinRM is going to say, I'm not allowed to listen on any IP addresses. So I'm simply going to start and run in the background, but not actually create any listeners. Aside from that setting, the others, another, a couple other settings you'll want to look at are under the PowerShell, Windows PowerShell um, option in the Group Policy Editor. You want to make sure that you enable script execution. And you can set the script execution policy to either remote signed or unrestricted. Now, something I'd like to take this opportunity to point out is that the script execution policy does not really act as a security feature. Even if you have your script execution policy set to restricted, any user or administrative user can bypass that and still execute PowerShell scripts by using the command at the bottom of the slide, which is powershell.exe dash execution policy bypass dash file, and then the path to the file. So again, a lot of people kind of see that script execution policy as a security feature. Um, I'm here to tell you that that's not a security feature because, again, any user can bypass that execution policy and execute a script. Some people like to use it as kind of a safeguard. So if you were to use the remote signed policy instead of the unrestricted policy, the only thing that that would gain you is that any script files that were downloaded from the internet would have to be unblocked uh, in order to execute them. So the browser typically adds what's called an uh, NTFS alternate data stream to the file. It adds what's called a zone identifier to that file. And that's when you go to the properties of that file and you see a little unblock button. That unblock button basically deletes that zone identifier and allows um, that file to be trusted. So uh, again, that's, that's kind of a really niche scenario, and I don't think that a lot of your users or admins are going to see that. So um, just to kind of save yourself the hassle, I generally recommend that people just set it to unrestricted. If somebody would someday like to challenge me on that, I would love to hear an explanation as to why it is actually a security feature, but that's my current understanding of it. Any questions at this point? Uh, I'm good so far. Anybody else? Cool. Well, let's continue. So we've co we've talked a little bit about the service configuration of WinRM and the PowerShell script execution policy. Um, now that we've looked at kind of configuring the server side of things, let's talk about the client side of things. So WinRM, the Windows Remote Management Service, has two components to it. There's the client, the WinRM client, and the WinRM service. So anytime that you have uh, maybe a laptop or a management server that you're planning on deploying these scripts from, you'll need to make sure that the WinRM client configuration is configured in such a way that it will allow scripts to execute across all your systems. You can configure the WinRM client to use certain types of authentic authentication. So you can use basic authentication, which is basically uh, clear text, uh, not recommended, uh, negotiate, Kerberos, uh, 
uh, client certificate mapping, and CRED SSP. Now, if you were not to configure anything else and you were to just make a standard, you know, outbound connection using one of the PowerShell remoting commands, typically you're going to get a Kerberos connection by default. But if you want to be a little bit more uh, kind of security conscious, then you may want to proactively disable the basic authentication so that you're not accidentally sending across clear text credentials in your environment. Uh, additionally, CRED SSP is something you'll, you'll want to be aware of. Uh, you definitely do want to enable that because it will help you out in the double hop scenarios. And we, we do have more information about that in a future slide. The trusted host setting is kind of important because any time that you're dealing with either workgroup clients or uh, maybe multi-forest environments or multi-domain environments, uh, typically your WinRM client is not going to implicitly trust other servers that are in the uh, workgroup environments or the uh, untrusted forest environments. So we'll talk a little bit about how to configure the trusted hosts, but you can use a wildcard that um, allows you to basically trust, you know, star.domain.com. So if you have, you know, domain1.com, domain2.com, domain3.com, you can do, you can configure the WinRM client on your laptop to trust all those remote systems that are in those various domains. And as long as you have control of your DNS infrastructure, you can typically trust that you're, you're only going to pass your credentials from your client to trusted servers. You can also configure the default ports. So if for some reason you decided to change the default ports of the WinRM service from 5985 and 5986, you could also configure your client so that you don't have to specify those custom ports every time that you make an outbound connection as well. And this is just a screenshot showing the various WinRM client options. So again, we have the various authentication options. We have the trusted host option. And we also have an option that I didn't mention called allow unencrypted traffic. And typically you can leave that not configured because by default WinRM does encrypt its traffic. So one other thing that's kind of more server side related, so WinRM service side related is the shell configuration. So there's a variety of settings called WinRM shell settings that allow you to kind of customize the um, remote PowerShell sessions that you're dealing with. You can restrict the number of shells that each user can invoke on a particular system. You can restrict the maximum number of concurrent users on a system. So if you only want maybe two or three people to be able to connect at one time, you can restrict that. You can set a maximum shell runtime so that you don't have people connected out there for days and weeks and months at a time. You can configure the max memory per shell so that you can kind of make sure everybody plays together nicely. So you can maybe give, uh, you know, a couple hundred megabytes of shell space to each uh, session, or maybe a couple of gigs, depending on how much memory is available on each system. Of course, any time that you're configuring these options, you want to make sure that you're practical about them, because if you crank the memory too far down, you'll prevent a lot of commands from successfully executing. So if you were to load you know, a, a very large variable into memory, so let's say maybe you import a really massive CSV file as part of your script that you're deploying, you could potentially exceed that max memory per shell and um, you know, end up getting an error. So you want to make sure that you do adequate testing with all these settings before you go uh, cranking them too far down. Now at the bottom here, I've just given an example of how you can browse this shell configuration. So you can actually browse to what's called a, a PS drive, which is WSMAN colon. And under that WSMAN drive, which is where all the WinRM configuration settings are stored, you can go to the local host and then go under the shell, and that will show you all these shell configuration options. And you can do the same thing for the client, the WinRM client, and the WinRM uh, service as well. And here is just a screenshot of what the GP editor looks like for the Windows Remote Shell settings. The critical piece here is going to be the allow remote shell access. If you have that set to disabled, then you will not be able to invoke uh, PowerShell sessions remotely. So go ahead and make sure that you set that setting to enabled. So now that we've talked a little bit about the PowerShell remoting configuration or WinRM configuration, you might be asking yourself, how do we take advantage of this functionality? How do we actually use it? Well. Thankfully, with PowerShell, everything that's 
every command that can be run interactively can also be run in a PowerShell script. So these are some of the commands that we can use to actually take advantage of PowerShell remoting. If you want to do an interactive remote management session with PowerShell, similar to SSH, you can use the enter PS session command. And that has a couple of parameters on it that'll, that allow you to specify which computer you want to connect to and whether you want to use SSL or not, and so on. If you don't want to necessarily create an interactive session, but you simply want to create a new um, PowerShell session that you could invoke future commands through, you can use the new PS session commandlet. So you can build up a, a, an array of these PS sessions in memory, and when you're ready to actually execute a command through those, you can then invoke the command through all those pre-existing sessions. You can also clean up those sessions through the remove PS session command. Uh, PowerShell version 3 introduces a concept called disconnected PS sessions. So in certain cases, uh, say you take your laptop uh, off of its dock, you put it to sleep, you bring it back up later on, those sessions could be disconnected. And PowerShell version 3 includes a command called connect PS session so that you can reestablish those connections. Now the invoke command is one of the really cool commands that I enjoy using a lot because it's very flexible. It basically allows you to invoke any arbitrary command, a uh, PowerShell script file, a PowerShell script block, or pretty much any PowerShell code against an array of remote computers. And we'll talk a little bit about how to use that in my demonstration scripts. Finally, there's a, a command called new PS session configuration file. And this isn't something we're going to go into too much depth about. However, you can create custom PowerShell session configurations. By default, out of the box, when you enable PowerShell remoting, you basically get a pretty basic set of PowerShell session configurations that only allow systems administrators, people who are in the local administrator's security group, to connect to those remote PowerShell sessions. However, if you want to publish the capability for maybe help desk users or you know certain business group users to connect to their own server, you can create what's called a custom PS session configuration. And you can restrict which commands can be run inside of that session configuration. So if there's, again, maybe one or two specific commands that you want to let people run inside of a session, you can use that to kind of restrict it. In addition to the PS session uh, commandlets, there's also some SIM commandlets, which is, stands for Common Information Model. And the common information model is basically a standards-based form of interacting with the Microsoft WMI, or Windows Management Instrumentation Service. And for those of you who may not be familiar with WMI, WMI exposes lots of various systems management information to the operating system so that you can manage it more effectively. For example, you can get BIOS information, um, make and model information, uh, even software level information like what processes are running or what DLLs have been loaded by processes and things like that. And the nice thing about the SIM commandlets module in PowerShell version 3 and later is that you can use these SIM commandlets along with PowerShell remoting or the WinRM service to get that firewall friendly remote management capability. If you were to use the old get WMI object command or the WMI class or WMI type accelerators in PowerShell version 2 and later, then you will probably run into firewall related issues because those again use the DCOM RPC channel and are a lot less predictable with how the network traffic is going to flow. And this slide here just kind of separates again the DCOM RPC and the WinRM services and why you should use WinRM. So DCOM RPC, again, it uses a dynamic port range, which means it's not very firewall friendly. It's hard for you know, network security people to kind of lock things down into a predictable traffic pattern. And again, DCOM RPC is not standards based either. However, WinRM is standards based. It's based on the WS management or web service management standard from the Distributed Management Task Force or DMTF. So Microsoft is obviously making some pretty intentional strides towards being standards-based. This is a good thing. So I mentioned CRED SSP a couple of times, and CRED SSP is a security support provider that's been available since, I believe, Windows XP, 
And what CredSSP basically does for you is it allows you to solve for the double hop authentication scenario. So in this diagram here, we have a client system called Client01. We have a server called Server01. And what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to deploy a script from Client01 out to Server01. Now, there's one stipulation. The stipulation is that Server01, that script that we're deploying to Server01 needs to access an authenticated network resource on Server02. So we're going to pretend that Server02 is a file server serving up, you know, just a standard Windows share. And the script that we're deploying from client01 to server01 accesses a file that's within that share. Now, if we didn't use CredSSP and we just used a standard Kerberos authenticated uh, connection, what would happen is we would successfully deploy the script from client01 to server01. But when that script ran on server01 and it tried to access the network resource on server02, the second hop, or that, that hop from server1 to server2, would be an anonymous connection because we did not delegate access to our credential from client01 to server01. So server01 tries to use our credential. It says you're denied because we didn't delegate that access to it. And so it tries to use an anonymous authentication connection out to server02. So with that in mind, it's very important that we configure CredSSP to handle this type of scenario. Now, the Windows platform has several different types of credentials. There's what's called the default credential, and that is basically the credential that you are currently logged into the Windows operating system with. So when you, you know, log on to your Windows 7, Windows 8 computer, that's your default credential. The saved credentials are credentials that you've stored in the Windows Credential Vault. So if you don't like typing passwords a lot, which I doubt anybody does, you might use the Windows Credential Vault to store those uh, passwords so that you don't have to type them all the time. Those are called saved credentials. And then finally, there's what's called fresh credentials. And fresh credentials are what you get any time that you create a credential object from uh, you know, a fresh username and password that are input by an end user. If you're familiar with the get credential command in PowerShell, that is an example of how to get a fresh credential. Now, when we're talking about CredSSP, the only type of credential that you can use in these connections is the fresh credential. There is no way with CredSSP, at least from PowerShell, to pass your default credential or your you know, current context or a saved credential from the credential vault into that PowerShell remoting session. So again, any time that you're going to do a CredSSP connection with PowerShell, you're going to want to make sure that you get a fresh credential. Now, configuring CredSSP requires a little bit of extra effort, but it's pretty straightforward. There's a few commands that you'll use to deal with CredSSP called get WSMAN CredSSP, enable WSMAN CredSSP, and disable WSMAN CredSSP. Now, when you're enabling WSMAN CredSSP, you'll have to enable it on both the client and the server. So on the client, you want to make sure that you basically configure that as a CredSSP client. And you will basically tell that client that it's authorized to pass credentials to any systems that are in your domain, such as Server 1 or Server 2. And this here is a screenshot of the CredSSP uh, group policy settings. Now, CredSSP uses what's called a service principle name. And when you're configuring this allow delegation of fresh credentials option, you'll plug in a service principle name that looks very similar to the one in the screenshot here. So it's basically wsman forward slash and then host name. So you can plug in either a static host name like server01, or you can plug in something like I have here where you put in a wildcard and say anything in my domain. So star.mybiz.loc. And what that allows me to do is from that client that has this configuration, I'm basically telling that client that it can trust anything, any computer that's within the mybiz.loc domain. So with WinRM, if you're troubleshooting any types of um, you know, remote connection problems, um, I just have kind of a few things I'd like to go over here real quick. First off is read the error messages. Sometimes the error messages can make a lot of sense. Other times they don't, and you have to do a lot more digging. But as a starting point, just make sure that you read the error message start to finish. It frequently contains very helpful information about 
what the problem is. If you're diving really deep into an issue and you're having trouble kind of figuring out what's going on, there's a command built into PowerShell called enable the PSWS man combined trace. And what that does is it spits out a ETL log file in the PS home slash traces directory. And you can use the get win event command to explore the messages that get logged to that ETL log file. Within the uh, computer management uh, event viewer, you, there's a log file under the Win Microsoft dash Windows dash WinRM slash operational event log. If you go into the properties of that, you can enable it and it will provide additional logging information. Since we're dealing with network connectivity here, uh, Nmap is always going to be a useful tool, as is NetStat. So on the client side, you're going to want to use Nmap to try to test those ports 5985 and 5986 on the server that you're trying to connect to. And on the server that you're trying to connect to, you'll want to run the netstat-aon command. And you want to make sure that there is actually a listener on port 5985 and 5986 for the client to connect to. This slide just describes some of the various issues I've come across uh, in my experiences with PowerShell remoting. Um, but I won't go too deep into any of these. There are a couple of limitations to be aware of with PowerShell remoting when you start getting into it. Uh, first of all is there is no support for nested PowerShell remoting sessions. So if you're currently in a remote session, then you will not be able to establish a new remote session from there. Additionally, interactive command line utilities such as disk part, NSLOOKUP, PSExec, things like that, they really don't work under remoting sessions too well um, because they're kind of sitting there waiting for user input. So I would not recommend trying to use those in your scripts, but feel free to experiment. And then finally, just be aware that if you are dealing with second double hop authentication, you've got to make sure that you're using the Credit SSP feature. So with that, I'd like to jump into a couple of demos. If anybody has questions at this point, uh, feel free to, because I just have to boot up a few virtual machines here. Trevor, uh, would you be able to make the slides available to us uh, afterwards so we can put it on the website? Yeah, definitely. Okay, that was one of the questions in the, the chat. Yeah, good question, Greg. Good, I'm glad you're getting something out of it, Greg. All right, I'm trying to think if I have any more VMs I want to boot up here. Let me uh, share out the other screen here. If you guys could just give me a heads up when you can see the VMware Workstation screen. Uh, still a black screen. Still a black screen? Okay. Let me try again. All right. Looks like it might have worked that time. Let me let me know. Yep. I see something now. Awesome. Got some VM stuff going on. Yeah. Awesome. Apologize, I didn't have my VMs all booted up in advance. Just coming up here, launching the PowerShell ISE, where I do most of my scripting work. So let's go ahead and uh, step through a couple of examples. Just going to open these up. 
So I want to start out with some pretty simple examples uh, in the demo one script here. So we talked a little bit about the commands that we use to actually create these remote PS sessions, right? So the first command that we want to look at is the enter PS session command. And what that allows us to do is just to establish an interactive PowerShell remoting session on a computer. So if we were to run a command on the domain controller here, which we're currently on, like env computer name, just to get the environment variable for the computer name, we see that we're running on DC01, right? Well, if we run enter PS session dash computer name SCCM01, we get a failure. Lovely. Let me try another one here. So Scorcha one. So this is my system center orchestrator server. And as you can see, we now have a command prompt that's prefixed with Scorcha one indicating that we're on that computer. So if we were to run that same command, env computer name, we can now see that we're running on Scorcha one instead of DC01. To get out of that interactive session, we can just type exit, pretty simple. I'd also just like to point out that we're not all just writing scripts. Sometimes we're doing interactive command line work, and you'll want to familiarize yourself with the built-in aliases for the various commands. And the alias for enter PS session is simply ETSN. So if we run this command, ETSN Scorcha one we get the exact same thing. Now, that's an example of how to use a standard HTTP connection, but what if we've deployed SSL in our environment and we want, to, we want to make sure that we're using SSL connections? Well, we can run the exact same command, enter PS session, but we, we have a switch parameter called dash use SSL. So if we were to run ETSN, client02, use SSL, we should get a secure session on that machine. thinking about it. It's really thinking about it. Uh, he doesn't want to work. Okay. Now, th actually, that, that was intentional. I apologize. I, it's been a while since I've run through these demo scripts. Now, the reason that this failed, this ETSN uh, command failed, is because we're actually connecting to Client02 using just its host name, not its fully qualified domain name. Now, why does that matter? Well, when you're creating a SSL session, what's happening is the WinRM service is comparing the host name that you pass to it to the SSL certificate that's been bound to the WinRM service. So again, that first example was intentionally uh, set up to fail because in the second example, we're calling the same command, but instead of using just the computer's host name, we're actually specifying the fully qualified domain name. And that FQDN, client02.myviz.loc, matches the name that's on this. So this command here should work momentarily. Uh, it's not going to cooperate tonight. Okay, well, for the sake of uh, the demo, just make sure that you're aware of the use SSL parameter to do interactive uh, SSL sessions. I do have a question for you. Sure, go ahead. On your scripts, you've got a semicolon at the end of every line. Is that really necessary, or what does that provide for you? Uh, good question. Is it necessary? No, it is not necessary. Um, what does it do for me? Um, to be honest with you, if I am writing a script and I've got, you know, maybe 30, 40, 50 lines of code, it's very easy to lose track kind of where you're at. Um, it's easy to lose track of, hey, did I open a string and forget to close the string? Or, um, you know, did I add a, a line continuation character, like the back tick, and forget to terminate a command? Well, the semicolon is the command terminator. And so as long as you terminate every line with a semicolon, what, what, can, what it can do for you, what the, the, ben the net benefit can be, is that when you receive an error message, rather than getting an error message that says, hey, the, the, the problematic line is way down on line 50, it'll generally keep the error kind of more relevant to the actual place in your code where the error is occurring. So it, it kind of helps the parser to 
more intelligently understand where your script lines start and stop. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think so. So it's really a recommended practice, you would say? Uh, for me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, d I doubt a lot of other people do that, but um, you know, I'm just kind of um, very yeah, intentional about kind of terminating my commands. I've seen it in other code, and I just wasn't sure what the uh, what the benefit of it was. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I like it so. <laughs> Very good. Now, the last example here, uh, we'll see if this one works. Um, what this is doing is it's entering a PowerShell remoting session on a computer called uh, caa1.mybiz.loc. But you'll see that there's another uh, parameter here called configuration name. Now, when you establish a PowerShell remoting session on a 64-bit system, you're going to get what's called the Microsoft.PowerShell session configuration by default. Now, in some cases, you might specifically want a 32-bit PowerShell session instead of a 64-bit PowerShell session. And if you want that on a 64-bit machine, you have to explicitly specify the Microsoft.PowerShell32 configuration name. So this example is just basically showing you how to uh, establish that 32-bit PowerShell uh, session on, on that remote machine. I'm actually going to run a command here really quick because it looks like my uh, certificate revocation list isn't uh, updated properly, and that probably just has to do with my certificate authority being offline for a few days. So um, I'm just going to run a command to force update the um, CRL publication to Active Directory. Insert util dash CRL to force the CRL to update. And then I'm going to go ahead and try that command again just to see if that works. Sure enough, it did. See? That's one of your first uh, WinRM troubleshooting experiences there. So if you get an error that's similar to this, where it says uh, the, the SSL certificate could not be checked for revocation, basically what's happening is that since my CA was offline for a while, the CRL distribution point, or CDP, which is in Active Directory by default, was not up to date. So what I had to do is, again, run this util dash CRL command on the certificate authority. That to the CRL distribution point in LDAP to update, and that allowed the uh, remote session to be invoked correctly. So I'm going to go ahead and exit out of that SSL session, and I'm going to go back and try client 02 again just to see if that fixed that one as well. I think that one may be having a different problem that's uh, maybe firewall related or something. So you guys get that, hopefully. So the next example is going to be an example of how to create a CRUD SSP connection. So we talked a little bit about CRUD SSP before and how you have to use what's called fresh credentials to establish CRUD SSP connections. So in this case, we're going to call get credential to get that fresh credential. We're going to assign the credential to the credential variable. So let's go ahead and do that. We've got this variable called credential that has our, our fresh credential in it. Now we're going to use a very, very similar command to what we had before in the previous example. Enter PS session, computer name. We're going to specify the fully qualified domain name of the remote computer that we're connecting to. We're also going to specify that we want a 32-bit session configuration, so we're going to specify Microsoft.PowerShell32. We're also going to specify use SSL to get the secure channel. And then what's a little bit different about this is right here. We're specifying that we want to use CredSSP as the authentication type. And because we're using CredSSP, we also must specify a fresh credential. So we're going to use the credential parameter and pass in that credential variable as our credential. So if we go ahead and line, let's see if we get a CredSSP connection to client01.
it seems the demo gods are with me tonight. So I actually have an interactive session here on client01.mybiz.loc. We specified that we have a 32-bit PowerShell session configuration. We're doing it across an SSL channel. And when we authenticated to that new PowerShell session, we used CredSSP. Now, there is a built-in variable in PowerShell when you establish a session configuration, uh, a remote session, called PS Sender Info. So if we were on PS Sender Info, you'll see that there's a few different properties on that variable. One of those properties is interesting about the connection string is that we can see which TCP port we've connected to. And this can be very helpful because if you're developing a script that maybe copies secure data like healthcare data or financial data or anything like that, you might want to ensure that you're using a secure channel. So what you can do is you can look at that connection string and say, hey, I want to make sure that this channel or this connection, this session, is running on port 5986, which is my SSL port. And if it is running on port 5986, then you could go ahead and copy that secure financial or healthcare data. But if you're not on port 5986 and you're on port 5985 instead, then maybe you want to take, take a different path in your script code and maybe notify an administrator that you're not connecting on a secure channel and that the script failed to copy that secure data as a result. So that's a very good kind of use case for that uh, connection string. There's also other information. You can see who the user is. So if you, in your, inside whatever script you're deploying, you want to say if you if you are this administrative user, then go ahead and follow this path of code. But if you're this other user, then maybe follow a different path of code. Now, if we drill down a few levels deep and we look at psenderinfo.userinfo.windowsidentity.authentication type, let's go on that and look at this. PowerShell is actually telling us that we're in a credit SSP connection. And this, again, like the connection string, is very useful because if your script specifically requires having double hop authentication available to it, then you may want to examine this property, this authentication type, make sure that it's cred SSP. And if it's not cred SSP, then again, maybe your script fails out and notifies an administrator to say, hey, I was not able to execute with cred SSP connection, so I could not successfully run this um, particular path of code. Anybody have questions on the uh, PS sender info variable or uh, cred SS point? So moving right along, uh, in this demo script, I just wanted to show you how to use the invoke command. Now invoke command is great because you don't have to create any background PowerShell sessions up front. Invoke command takes care of building up those PowerShell sessions and tearing them down for you in the background. So anytime that you want to invoke a, a command on a computer, all you really have to do is specify the computer name parameter, and that could be one or more computers as an array. And then the only other parameter that you really have to specify is the PowerShell script block that you want to run on that computer. And for those of you who may be unfamiliar with a PowerShell script block, it's basically just a block of code that's enclosed inside of curly braces and executes some arbitrary commands. So in this case, we have a command that goes out I on the local system and simply obtains the BIOS version of that system. So maybe your scenario is that you're running an audit. Let's say you're a desktop administrator or maybe you're uh, a server administrator and you're, you're auditing your bare metal servers, and you want to make sure that they're all running the latest BIOS or firmware version, right? So you, you run this uh, get WMI object command, grab the BIOS version, but you want to deploy that to all your remote computers. Well, what you can do is create this block of code called a script, which again is just enclosed in the curly braces. And then you tell invoke command which computers you want to run that on. 
And optionally, you can specify the use SSL parameter so that when invoke command creates that remote PowerShell session for you against each computer, it does it under a secure channel. So let's go ahead and try and run this one command. And you'll see that it runs very quickly. And what it did is it reached out to this machine called client01.mybiz.loc. It ran this block of code to get the BIOS version from that computer over a SSL channel. And then it passed the result back to us in our host session. Pretty cool, right? So we didn't actually have to connect to client ENT01 or client 01 to get that information. We simply did it from our remote uh, machine. Now, if you want to take this a step further, you can run that same command or a similar commands against multiple computers. So in the next example, I want to talk about how to do that against you know, an array of computers. Now, you can get a list of computers from pretty much any source. You could use a text file. You could use a database connection to connect to a database and run a query and return a list of computers as an array uh, as far as who you want to run this command on. But in this example, I'm just going to go ahead and go out to Active Directory using the Active Directory PowerShell module. I'm going to grab the names of a bunch of computers from Active just like so. And then for each of those computers, I'm actually going to ping it and make sure that it's actually alive before I try to connect to it. So I'm going to use the PowerShell where object to filter my results from Active Directory to show me only computers that respond to pings. And then finally, at the end here, you might notice that I have a times 10. And what that's going to do is it's the array of computers that I get back from Active Directory and multiply it by 10 so that we have a simulated large environment. Of course, I only have about 10 computers in my lab here. So if we want to simulate a larger environment, we can simply multiply that array several times over and get a larger list of computers. To run this line of code, it's going to go out to Active Directory. It's going to ping each computer. And if it's alive, it's going to add it to that array. So now that command is done, and if I were to examine that variable, I have a big list of roughly 100 computers. There we go. Now, now that I've gotten the list of computers I want to run the command on, I need to, to specify the command that I want to execute on those computers. So I'm going to create a PowerShell script block and assign it to a variable. And what that script block is going to do is it's going to get the local computer's name, add a comma, get the operating system, caption, add another comma. It's going to get the BIOS version from that computer, and that's going to be it. So if we were to run that as a test on the local computer here, this data down here is what our results would look like. But what I'm going to do is create a script block and assign that to a variable so that I just have that block of code prepared in a variable. So now that I have my list of computers and the command that I want to execute against those computers, again, all I have to do is call invoke command, specify the array of computers rather than just a single computer, and specify the script block that I want to execute on each of those computers. So let's go ahead and run that line as you can see we're starting to get some results back here and the format of the data coming back from those remote PowerShell sessions is very similar to the result that we got on the local computer when we tested that script block so now that the command is finished what we can do is basically copy all that text and we could then just control C it, pretend we're opening up Excel, paste it into Excel, and Excel has a nice option that allows you to split data off of a character such as a comma. So basically, we can build a report very rapidly from real-time data using PowerShell, remoting. Now, you might have noticed that the command prompt was tied up while this command was running, right? So this command, if we were running it across maybe 10,000 computers instead of just 100 computers, 
could take a lot more time. Also, the script that we were running was pretty simplistic, so it didn't take very long to run inside of each session. However, that script could take potentially 5, 10, or maybe an hour to run, right? So what we can do to kind of work around that issue is to specify a parameter on the invoke command called as job. And what that does is it basically creates a background job inside a PowerShell that allows us to continue working with our PowerShell session locally while that background remote job is running. So as you can see, rather than getting the results back immediately, invoke command just gave us a job. And if we call get job and specify the job ID of four, we can see that it's still running. Now we can call a command called wait job to wait for that job to finish. What that'll do is it'll cause the PowerShell prompt to block or pause until the state of that job is completed. And as you can see, at this point, the job is now finished. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, that's great and all, but how do I actually get the results that I wanted from the job like I did up here? Well, that's a great question. In order to get the results from the job, you will see that the job has a property called has more data. And as long as has more data is true, then there's data that we can receive from that job. So I'm going to basically say receive the data from job with the ID of four. And then I'm going to specify an additional parameter called keep, and that will keep the data inside the job instead of doing the default behavior, which is to clear the data out. So if I run that receive job command, you can see that I get all the results spit out to my console, just like I did when I ran the command without the as job parameter. So basically what that allows you to do is queue up a lot of background jobs. You can keep working in your PowerShell session, and you can then just use the get job command to kind of keep an eye on those jobs and see how they're coming along. Does anybody have questions on that? Well, I'm going to skip over one of my scripts. Uh, let's see, was there a question? Okay, Ron says he's good. I'm going to skip over one of the demo scripts and go on to the last one since we're kind of running low on time here. And this script is going to show how to use CRUD SSP uh, once more, a bit more practically. So again, the first thing with CRUD SSP is to make sure that you get a fresh credential. So we're going to go ahead and get that fresh credential. We're going to store it in a variable called credential. Now, in the next few lines here, I'm going to build a script block that contains a few commands. And basically, all this command or this miniature script is doing is it's checking to see if a particular file exists in the root of the C drive. If that file does exist, it's going to clean it up, and then it's going to ensure that it's gone, and then it's going to copy it back and then it's going to ensure that it actually exists. So if we were to run uh, just this command on our local machine, this down here is the example output that we would get if we were to invoke it on either a local machine or a remote machine. So first, the file does not exist. And then after we copy it, the file does exist. The root of our C drive, and we look for that file name. Sure enough, it does exist. So we're going to deploy this command, this cred SSP command, that is a file from a secondary file server called SSCM01. And we're going to deploy this command out to the machine called client01. First, I have to run this few lines of code here to specify my script block of code, assign it to the my command variable. And now I'm going to deploy this command, this block of code, out to my machine called client01. And I'm going to specify that I want to use cred SSP authentication because this script hops out to a second resource, which is sccm01. So let's go ahead and run line 23 here. There you go. Sure enough, we get that same result. So we deployed the script from dc01 out to client01. Client01 
looked at that file and said, hey, do you exist? It says, no, it doesn't. So it reaches out to SCCA and it copies it to the root of the C drive. And if we go on to client01, we can see that that file, sure enough, does exist. So if we were to delete that file, go back and rerun our command again, and we go back to client01, we can now see that client01 did successfully copy that file from the root of the SCCM01 C drive. So again, that's just an example of how CRED SSP authentication allows you to deal with that double hop scenario. If you didn't use CRED SSP for that type of connection, then you would receive a failure when that command tried to run. So if we were to run just this part of the command that I have selected in the PowerShell ISE, of course, you get an access denied message because when the copy item command tried to copy that file from that secondary file server, it was trying to use an anonymous authentication connection. So with that, that pretty much concludes my presentation and the demo scripts. Um, I hope that was useful to everybody and that maybe you picked up on one or two new things. And if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to take them on. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, you can, you can uh, ask him directly. Was this uh, helpful to anybody, or did, did you learn anything new? Is there, um, have you already done all this? This is Greg. No, it's all, this is all new for me, um, which is why I'd like to see the slides, you know, get a copy of the slides, because there's a lot of information there that I could use. Definitely. I'll, I'll send these over to Mike and uh, Ron. Pretty great. But I appreciate you taking the time, and it is informative, so thank you very much. Well, thank you for attending. I appreciate your time. Yeah.